Hi. There's our intro music. What's up, Worship Drummer family? I am here with none other than Dan McMurray. And uh, Dan, welcome to the Worship Drummer Hangout, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Heck very yes. excited to be back with the fam. Yes, uh, it's been a while. Last time you and I hung out in person, at least, was on the People Tour. 20, yeah. June 2019 here in Toronto. So a lot's gone on since then. That's crazy. <laughs> a global pandemic of proportions. And um, for those of you joining, just want to say welcome. How it's going to work tonight is Dan and I will have a conversation. This is like the hangout time. I got my, my mug with my Americano. Dan has his water jug. Boom, ready to go. And uh, so I, we're just going to ask some questions. But if you have a, a specific question, um, why don't we won't pay attention too much in the beginning, but probably um, in about 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, we're going to start paying attention to the chat for your questions. But as we get started, um, in the chat, just let us know where you're tuning in from. Dan and I are checking out the comments, and uh, we're just stoked to hang out. This is the Worship Drummer Hangout an idea. That I just said, hey, once a month, why don't we bring on a guest? Um, go live on YouTube. Yes, we're crazy enough to do that. And uh, just... And today, uh, first of all, how life um, these days what are you up to where are you living I'm sure everyone has a million questions especially missing on the gram now so um, <laughs> just kind of give us a, a quick life update and uh, and then we'll get into some actual drumming questions in a bit yeah awesome um, I, by the way I closed um, I closed the YouTube chat so i can't see the chat anymore because i was losing you for a little bit so if there's okay no, no any worries. questions i'm just gonna leave that up to you um i'm i've been really good I obviously like life has been crazy for a few years now huh um i can't believe that was 2019 the last time i saw you but um uh uh in december because i was living in la with my my family and in December of 2019, we moved down to Orange County, not really having any idea of what was about to happen. So when um, the pandemic hit, I, um, I actually took a staff position with, with Hillsong Music. And so I started working at our studio and managing our studio here. Like it was kind of like this space in, in Orange County that is nothing crazy glamorous. Um, it was built originally like just to kind of be a rehearsal workshop space, you know, like it's not like a crazy steady art studio at the time. And then um, a lot of, a lot of, you know, key people kind of had moved here. So um, it just made sense for us to have a space to work from. So I took a role um, running that studio and engineering and also, you know, being a musician, drumming and for any, anything, you know, so that was actually a blessing at the, you know, still is a blessing, but it was a blessing at the time, especially because all of the tours had gotten canceled in 2020. And I was like, man, that's, that's unfortunate what I'm going to do. And then, um, yeah, so I was pretty thankful that that was something that was able to happen. So I'm still, still doing that, still in that role. And then obviously, um, once, once the pandemic hit, um, we just kind of had to figure out what we were going to do because there was no tours. Um, so we, we, you know, we worked on some projects and we did a few things there because Brooke, who was overseeing Hillsong Worship and Joel was overseas um, United, they both, you know, lived here and worked here, you know, um, so like at the space. So it just kind of made sense. It was kind of a hub for us to get a little bit creative and, you know, so that's basically what I've been doing. And then 
you know, we released like a kind of a project of old songs called Take Heart Again. That was 2020. And then um, the first like five months of my job was pretty crazy because I basically was like a builder, you know, like I kind of, once we realized that we needed to do a lot more in that studio that than it was originally built for, we kind of decided, well, let's try and make it sound decent. Mm. So I spent, you know, probably five months building sound panels and, and just constructing. It was kind of cool. I kind of felt like, you know, a real man out in the sun every day, just building. But, um, yeah. So then, then, um, and then for a year and a half, uh, the last year and a half been working on the United album with Joel and some of the guys here and finally got to tour again this year, which was really fun. You know, it was really nice to be home, like spending time with, you know, the family and the kids, like, it's just, it was, it was a really special time, I guess, but um, it was also really nice to get back out on the road this year. So that's kind of what I've been doing. So cool, man. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I'm sure um, a lot of people are wondering. And so you mentioned, uh, are you the drummer now? What happened to Cobes? Uh, you know, that's what the people want to know. <laughs> what the people want to know. Um, so I'm checking settings in case I can change. Um, I don't know if I can. Um, so if I don't, if I don't hear what you say, I'll, I'll ask you to repeat it. But, um, no, so what happened was when I actually started the like started the job, they had kind of already been working on some music, and there was no like specific project in mind planned. Um, but they'd been working on some music, so I I've kind of for the last few United albums um, worked on them with with the guys. So I was kind of I already kind of had a really good um, kind of chemistry with with everyone and and me and Cobes like you know we're bros and so for the last few albums like I kind of was around a lot and but for the people album I engineered for you know the two months of working on that and me and Cobes were just you know I would just help him work on parts and just watch and be amazed by what he did and and just tell him he's awesome and you know so it was kind of cool like I've kind of always had a little bit of a good relationship with with those guys and being around for the last few albums and then um when the pandemic hit obviously a lot of things changed and I was already you know helping Joel because Joel was here and Cobes was in in Sydney with some of the other guys um I was kind of already just helping Joel and then you know Cobes they had a kid and you know he 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 you know moved on to some other pretty exciting things in life and I guess I guess he just decided that you know, obviously, like, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of, of yeah, him, no. like, he, you know, um, but he's, he, you know, wanted to be a dad and, you know, traveling's really hard. And I'm sure if you get the chance to talk to him, he, he'll talk about it. But yeah, I guess like, I kind of, I kind of, it was actually a funny situation because there wasn't like an official, you know, transition. I, I, I remember for the album we just released, um, all this future, I was, I would get into the studio here and record some drum parts as a demo. And then I'd just send them to Sydney. And I just kind of assumed like Simon would get on and change them all and make them way better. And then, yeah. and then it got, it kind of got to the point where, you know, he, he was getting busier doing some other stuff. And so all these, all these drums that I've recorded, you know, one take off to be a demo, they were putting them into the songs. And I was like, oh, okay, I kind of, I'm kind of getting the point that maybe I should take it a little bit more seriously as I'm recording these ideas. <laughs> and so that album process was so long. And so it was difficult in a lot of ways, you know, because of trying to do it in two different countries on the other side of the world during COVID with no travel and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it just kind of, it just kind of happened. And yeah, I guess now I'm, drumming for United as well as some other stuff. So I don't know if that That's answers wild. it. That's a long yeah, answer. Yeah, but... yeah. And also in between that, you played on Brooks album at, that was recording at the belonging too, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. That was incredible. That was one of the most incredible things I've been a part of. 
Wow. Um, yeah, no, that album has some very special songs personally for me. Mm -hmm. um, but but it sounded like that night. Uh, I don't know if because it was kind of it was in 2021, right? Yeah, it was November last year we recorded that. And I don't know, may, like, do you, what do you feel led to that being such a special moment? Like, I, in my mind, I go to like, well, maybe the church hadn't gathered in that capacity in a while. And maybe in the state, it's different than where I'm in Toronto. But like, do you think any of the pandemic played into the church gathering to sing? Yeah, I mean, I think at, I think at that point, the belonging had been meeting for a while. Um, like I think in Tennessee, the laws were different to here in California. So, yeah. so I think that they, they were having church and, um, which is awesome, but we, uh, we still had a lot of restrictions here. So, um, I think, I think what made that album really special was just the fact that like it's anointed, like, and, and Brooke, you know, she's so, she's so talented, but she's so purposeful. And, um, I think, I think the, I think I knew it was special. I mean, obviously the songs are incredible. So, yeah. you know, I was, I was hearing some of the songs as she was kind of working on them and writing them. And we would demo a few of them here at the studio, just like a, a you know, a, her voice and a piano. I was like, wow, they, you know, some of these are awesome. All of them are awesome. But, um, I knew there was something really special about it. We did, we workshopped and demoed that, that whole album in six days in Nashville in August last year. So a year ago and Brooke and the producer, Jason Ingram, they were so particular, well, not particular, but just, um, purposeful and thoughtful about who was going to be involved in the album and who the band was going to be. Wow. And there was there was people in the band that Brooke hadn't actually met until we got to Nashville to workshop and, and start working on these songs. But they just felt so strongly that this this group of people is, is meant to be doing this album. And so I remember the first day, you know, I remember I remember the first day she sat us down, she talked to us, to us and she was talking about how sometimes there's an ease to these things and sometimes there's not. And, you know, I just, I remember feeling as though there was something so special and we weren't in this glamorous studio. Like we were in, we we're in this cool like space that was technically a studio, but it was right next to a train track. So every 15 minutes, these huge long trains would shake the building. And it was like, it was really cool, but something about that space that just transformed the second we walked in. And I just remember everything just flowed out of all of us. It just, mm -hmm. it just flowed. And it did actually feel really effortless. And I think that there was just simply like this feeling of like God's hands on this group of people, you know? And so, um, those, those moments, I remember when we were workshopping those songs that we would just worship, like we would just play these songs for 20 minutes. And at the end of it, no one said anything. We were just, we felt so heavy. I remember being, I remember just being in tears the whole week, basically, you know? And so it was just, it was just something about that album. And then, and then it was really cool because when it came to recording that on the night, Brooke had actually sent the demos of the songs from that week we had done to all the people that were going to be there. So everyone came wow. for the most part knowing the songs, or at least like a huge chunk of the people that were there actually came knowing the songs, um, which is really good when you're trying to capture a live album is when people sing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I just think, I just think, you know, whatever, I don't, you just can't really explain. It. There's no, nothing to put your hand on, like nothing to put your finger on. It was just a really special kind of experience. Yeah. That's so cool, man. Um, I see a lot of questions coming in, so I just want to acknowledge that and say we're going to get to them soon. Um, so again, you can uh, put your comments in our uh, live stream chat and we'll get to that in uh, a few minutes. And so Dan, um, what, 
in your world, I see your world because you're like literally on the other side of uh, this here. And like, what do you feel God is about to do in his church, Big C, capital C Church? I mean, um, yeah. Know, so, from, keep going. from what you see, the experiences you're having, um, what's your take on that? I mean, it's kind of interesting for us as a church right now, as in Hillsong, you know? Yeah. It's been a crazy couple of years, and it's still pretty crazy for us. And it's hard to kind of, to, to you know, we're, we're in the thick of it right now, you know? And it's very close to home for us with a lot of mm. stuff that's going on within our church and, and, you know, a lot of stuff that has to be resolved. And it's hard to kind of, like, when, when, it's, it's, it's kind of easy when you're a part of a church and everything's just kind of cr cruising on like normal to kind of pay attention to the rest of the world a little bit more. But when all of a sudden you have a little bit of crisis within in your own family, it's, it's kind of, it causes you to go, wait a second. Like we, I, I need to take care of like my family right now, you know? And it's just this feeling of like, let's get healthy. Let's rebuild. Like, let's just throw everything out like let's throw the playbook away you know like yeah. so i i mean it was kind of obvious during the pandemic that the capital c church like was kind of shaken a little bit because it completely changed how we had to do church but i genuinely think that like at least for me the way it feels is that we've gotten to the point as a capital c and even within our own church where it's like all right let's kind of get back to basics a little bit mm. like like it's just it's just it's been incredible and there's a lot of amazing churches doing amazing things but i think from a theological standpoint it's like let's let's dig deep let's dive in and let's let's find the substance in our faith and what we believe and then also from a, a an approach of how we actually do church how we structure church how we actually what does the service look like? What does work like our worship part look like? What does the preaching look like? So I know for us here, specifically in, in California, um, our California lead pastor, Sam, he wants to really um, change um, some of the teaching methods and, and like focus on like getting really substantial kind of th theological depth, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's that's also affecting how our services feel and look and how people are involved and but I, I'm I to answer your question, like I if I'm just gonna talk about it from the perspective of what I'm in the midst of, I'm really hopeful and I'm really excited. And I think it's kind of like I've seen a lot of people and some of my close friends be so burnt and have walked away, you know, from church and I'm like I don't blame them. Like I can see how they got hurt. So let's fix it. And let's just try and make sure that doesn't happen again. And so I'm, we're, we're hopeful. Like we're, our spirits are high, even in, in the fire right now, because it's like, yeah. okay, let's, let's, we have a chance to just kind of rebuild and, and start from scratch and get back to basics. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's how it is for a lot of people around the world. I mean, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, but, there's a feeling of like wanting to actually just kind of keep, keep the main thing, like the most important thing, you know? Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Uh, I'll answer your question to me now, but then on the flip of that, I was also wondering, so I'll say it so we could come back to it. How does this, what you just share inform the kind of songs that are being written and even just, how does it renew your passion to play drums and to continue to minister in a in fresh way, if you know what I mean? So um, just from my perspective, again, Canada, Toronto, we've had a very rough go with COVID. Um, but I don't anymore. I want to talk about doing it. So, I like to be hopeful. Like you said, um, like for us, we're looking at launching a second campus in the fall of 2023. And 
what I feel like the last two years have done, and I've heard so many people say this, so I don't want to just sound like I'm repeating or regurgitating it, but there's been a shaking. And the things that needed to fall off, so to speak, uh, notice I didn't say people necessarily, but things, even the things in me were shaken. And, you know, I said, Lord, may what remains be the things that you want, those big rocks, the boulders that need to be there as foundational. And so I feel like for the church, those who are kind of just playing church and going through the motions, they struggled and a lot of them shut their doors. And the churches that were already in momentum, that, you know, like Jesus is the main thing, doesn't mean that they had smooth sailing the whole way. Um, but I do feel like God is blowing a fresh wind in those sails. And not seeing, you know, churches, crazy testimony saying, no, actually the last year or two have been the biggest uh, intake in terms of people wanting to serve, um, in terms of money and financing the work of the kingdom. And, um, you know, so I look at that will always be true he said i'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail so you know sometimes it means some people come and some people go but jesus's promise is going to always stand the test of time until he comes back for the church so anyways not to get too preachy and to dive into all of that but um yeah hopeful is a great word and um my heart the most breaks for the kids. You know, my kids were, did school online for so long, and we we're just dying. In the past, ministry of the different. It's it's really my kids and the kids in church that um, I'm like, Lord, let these two years almost be like it never happened for them, and that they would be able to thrive in the now and what you're doing. Anyways. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Yeah. In a nutshell. So yeah. back to, back to uh, what you were saying. Um, like, So how does this inform the songs maybe that you are seeing being written and like seeing this as a fresh opportunity for yourself even? Um, what does that feel like now when you get ready to record or get behind the drums again? I mean, it kind of all goes hand in hand with the idea of a feeling like there's a pruning, you know, and kind of similar to what, what you were saying. But I mean, it, for me, it, it's crazy because like, um, we actually just had a writing retreat um, for United again. Um, and like a couple of weeks ago. So we had, a, we had a few people come over from Sydney and we spent two weeks and we just spent time together. And we just, cause we weren't able to do that for a long time. And yeah. that's how we've always made these records. He's like, we just get together and we just, we let it all flow and we just, it, it's community and it's family. So we actually just did a trip. And what's interesting is, and when I say trip, I mean, it was here, but we call it a writing trip or a writing retreat. But um, what's interesting is the, the songs that I'm hearing being written now compared to a year ago, mm. there is so much people's eyes are lifted a little bit. So like, um, there's no, there's no surprise. Like if you listen to the, the United record, we just released like a few months ago you can hear the weight of it, you know, in the lyrics, because not only were we walking out this journey during, you know, pandemic, hate to bring it up again, but that was the time that we were writing. Um, but we were also, you know, going through a lot as a church. And what's crazy is Joel, Joel's so prophetic. And he, I remember him writing songs that, spoke to the situation that would happen with our church 
six months before that situation happened. Mm. And I just, I remember, you know, I mean, there was probably 30 songs we had on, on, you know, that we had worked on or like started workshopping and messing with. And all of them were, were great, but there were some that were really special. And now in hindsight, I'm looking at it going, wow, these songs were written for our church in, in the current season it's in before we even necessarily knew this is what we, we were going to be going through. And so there's a lot of, a lot of reflection, a lot of, you can kind of hear a little bit of turmoil in, in some of the songs and a lot of, there's still a lot of hope always. There's always hope, right? Like yeah. that's the biggest thing. And, um, I know, I know for me, um, as far as like sitting behind the drums, like, um, I'm just always, I just always want to, um, always want to play and write parts that I think are good for the song, but I should never, I want to, I always want it to feel as though I could potentially play something I've never played or writ write something I've never written. And I think that that's how a lot of our songwriters are as well. You know, and it's, it's this feeling of kind of like just bringing life, bringing new life and new revelation to the songs we're writing. And, and as far as I go, like, I mean, I'm, I, you know, write some songs, but or I try to, but, you know, even behind the drums, like, um, that's, that's always the goal. So I can kind of see that like people's eyes are lifted, you know, at the moment, like it's kind of hard to answer that question in, in some way, but yeah, I hope that no. makes sense. That's, oh, that's cool. Um, we have some good questions coming in. How are we for time so far? Almost yeah, I'm good. Hard. Okay. Uh, uh, before we get to your questions, which by the way, um, if you're watching on YouTube in the live chat, you can drop your questions there for Dan and uh, we'll get to them in a couple of more minutes. Um, but maybe there are those um, that never heard like an interview with you um, for like specifically for drums. So, um, maybe we can, as we, um, how did you get started playing drums? Number one. And then number two, how did you get connected at Hillsong? Cause you've played for a bazillion years by now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess so. Um, I started playing drums when I was really young. So I think my uncle gave me a pair of drumsticks when I was three. And so I just started hitting my toy boxes and, um, I had, I had a, a toy box that had teddies in it and that sounded like a kick drum. Then I had a toy box that had Legos in it and that sounded like a snare drum and then pillows, some pillows sound like good toms, you know? So that's kind of how I, I was as a three year old. And then I started, you know, I grew up in church, um, and my family was kind of the worship team. You know, my parents were the pastors of this church and my mom would lead worship. My dad played bass. My brother played guitar. My sister played piano. And I, at six, I started playing drums in church every week wow. as the drummer. There was one morning I, I was sitting at the drums. It wasn't a big church, maybe, you know, but I was sitting at the drums one morning and I was hitting them with pens, like biros, and um, the drummer never showed up. And so then church just kind of started, you know, the old lady sat at the organ and started playing and she told me to stay and you know, I couldn't really play drums. I couldn't reach the pedals as a six year old, but she told me to stay. And then, and then he, the drummer never came back and I was the new drummer every week. So that's kind of, that's kind of always been my life is every week playing in church. And, and then when I was um, 18, just before I turned 19, I moved to Sydney um, with a friend of mine and started going to, to Hillsong in the city. But I, I didn't move with the intention to necessarily do anything crazy with, with the church. Like I, I moved and I got a job at a studio and I wanted to play in bands and that's what I did for a long time. But just through serving at church every weekend and playing every Sunday, like I kind of ended up, you know, doing, doing more and getting more opportunities. And then I think I did my first Hillsong worship album um 12 years ago god is able was my first wow. live album and so i kind of yeah i kind of been around but I, I was i was just always around just in church and then 
you know, just kept, kept getting asked to do stuff and I was, I was down. And then at one point I was like trying to do Hillsong worship stuff and be in a band. And, um, and then eventually what happened was I just felt like I was meant to move to LA. So I moved to LA and, and, um, that's when I, that's when things kind of went a little bit crazy with, with doing more Hillsong stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome, man. So that's the journey in case anyone, um, wanted to know a little more about the backstory. So, uh, we'll get to some questions now. I think it's, uh, it's appropriate. So, okay. The one I'm seeing a lot is the one that we thought would be asked, which is why, why aren't you on Instagram? What happened? <laughs> um, you know, so I'll, I'll just turn that straight over to you to uh i know well look i miss you all i do miss the worship drummer fam that's for sure um i just got to a point where you know i think it was like october of 2020 or something i got to a point where there's a lot going on and um i i found social media i found it to be stressful to feel this pressure to post and and it's really simple it's really simple that i was like First of all, it's just mindless, right? You just second, right? Because why not? And I was yeah. like, man, this is crazy. Like, it just happens, and so, and then also, I just, I just, I'm not great at posting, especially if I don't have good content. And um, I'll I'll have great content when someone else is taking pictures on tour. Like that's easy. Like thank you. I'll just post the pictures that someone else has taken. True. But um when there was no touring and we, we were kind of, I was building this studio and we weren't really doing anything crazy. I was like, I mean, I could sit at the drum kit and maybe film something, but I started to add this pressure to myself. Like, you've got to post, you got to post, you got to be, you got to be there. And then I was like, why am I doing this? This is causing me stress and anxiety, like it's stressing me out. So I just, I just simply got to a point where I was like, all right, I'm going to delete it. And I'm not saying I won't be back on it one day. Like I'm still, if I still think about it, I'm like, when I'm on tour, I'm like, oh, it'd be fun to have Instagram right now, you know, because I could post about it. But even that thought, it just, it kind of was a stress. So it's a really simple thing. I just kind of got sick of it for a little bit, but I, there's parts of it I miss and definitely the community side of it, you know? Yeah. But I might be back on one day. So. And we'll welcome you gladly. (laughs) Um, the, I, I think someone even created a fan account. Do you remember that one? I think oh, he did. I just, uh, yeah, like, you know, what? I think I think there are probably a lot of people out there that share similar sentiments. Maybe they don't realize the connection to like anxiety, um, but but definitely, um, you know. I, I can see full on why you're like, I don't want to, like, why put yourself through that stress when you can just delete? Totally. So, yeah. I mean, um, it's, yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out one day. We'll be back on. Push. Uh, okay. John, your questions. Um, I went into your decision to switch Zildjian from Dream Symbols. Uh, and yeah. why did you choose the specific symbols you did from Zildjian? It's a good question. Good question. And if, if I ever cut you off, by the way, John, I'm sorry. It's probably because you're cutting out for me. So I'm not trying to, if I'm, I don't trying to be rude. Um, no, you're good. If that, if that happens. Um, so I love dream symbols. And I think like, I think there's a lot of symbols that they make that sound amazing. Um, but I, there's two reasons. One, I kind of um, had always felt as though when I played Zildjian cymbals, like they kind of were built for me, you know? Um, and so it's it's like you just, sometimes you sit at a drum kit or you, and you play and either the drums or the cymbals, it feels like the way I'm playing right now, it's responding to the way I'm playing. And I always felt that way with Zildjian. And on top of that, I was like, if I have to be with one cymbal company to cover every genre possible um you know to pick zildjian because i just always like them it's 
you know, from, from a young age. And also the company, the company history is insane. It's, it's, I think it's the oldest company or something like that. They just had their 400th anniversary and it's still family owned by the Zildjans. But the story of, of Edith Zildjian is just insane. So I like the company. Um, and then on a, on a logistical, from a logistical standpoint, I struggled being a touring artist with Dream, uh, with with the scale of their company. So even though they're, they're incredible guys to work with and they make great symbols, I found myself playing a cracked crash for three months on tour because I couldn't find a replacement anywhere and they were on back order. That's and that was a that was a big thing for me. And then the way I came about to picking the Zildjian symbols is we were playing in Boston. So I went to the factory and I had a tour of the factory. That was insane. The Zildjian factory tour of the factory. That was incredible. And then, um, I signed with them and they have a artist vault, which basically has 10 of every symbol they make. And so I spent probably an hour and a half, two hours, just playing every symbol. And I picked 10 of my favorite. And then pairing my hi-hats is probably where I spent the most time because I like big hi-hats, but I don't like them to be trashy. So I went around and found every 18 inch symbol I could find and just kept pairing them until I found something I liked. And yeah, and I'm still, I'm still unsure. It's probably only been the last six months that I've really landed like what I want my crashes to be because for a long time, Zildjian also, that was a big thing. Zildjian didn't make big crash symbols. Right. They always kind of went to a 20 inch and then that was kind of it. You'd have to play a ride, but they're, they're kind of expanding on that a little bit. And a lot of their K Constantinople stuff, you know, their crashes or their rides, but they, they work well as big crashes. So that was a big deal for me too. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, here's kind of a, a fun question in a world without drumming, what career path would you pursue Dan McMurray? Um, this is a great question. If I could be incredible at anything else, like if I could just assume that I'm going to be really good yeah. at something else, um, I think golfers have a pretty good life and I'm not, I, I, I don't really, I don't play much. I'm not great, but you get to kind of travel the world and walk around in the sun, and walk around on the golf course for four days a week. Like that sounds kind of fun. Um, either that or being like, a gamer on Twitch, like that's a pretty cool job. Like if you can make it at that, but the honest truth is like, I, um, I love building stuff. I really love building. I love crafting and creating. So it would probably be something in that sense, whether that's designing, designing and building furniture or something creative. I don't know. It's, it's a really good question, but it definitely wouldn't be something too intellectual. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. After all, I, st- I still just hit stuff with sticks. That, that's what <laughs> I do. So <laughs> love it. Um, all right, Matthew Hill, another question. Drum and for Jesus also, do you have any warm up routines that you do before you start drumming? And if so, what are they? I missed the first half of that, but is the essence, um, do I have any warm up routine? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I do, I have a very, I have a very strict kind of, well, not strict, but I, I like make sure that I do this every night before I drum. Um, first of all, I drink a ton of water all day. I try and work out every morning, but nothing crazy. Like I try not to build too much muscle. I just try and keep my body when I'm on tour at the same point of, you know, not building too much. So I don't get too much muscle fatigue, but I definitely work out to keep my cardio up and then I drink a ton of water. I don't eat too close to drumming. I find that it can, kind of can make me a little bit lethargic. And then I have a 45 minute warm up routine which is basically stretching. And I don't, I don't spend a lot of time. So I basically do, I stretch, I stretch my 
my arms. I'm quite quite flexible. Um, <laughs> I stretch my arms, my forearms. I stretch my legs, my groin muscles, especially. And then I'll probably do that for 30 minutes, 35 minutes. And then, and then often I find that if I stretch um, the right way with my arms, I like, I, it feels like I've been warming up on a practice pad. And so I'll do things like I, I sit there and I kind of like rub my forearm like this for 10 minutes each side, like just kind of getting all these muscles, like just all the arm stuff, right? And then I'll spend 10 to 15 minutes just doing some rudiments on a pad just to get my um, my tempo, like just to get my inner metronome kind of locked in. And then if I do that, I kind of find myself um, not really exhausted and not really in pain. I don't really get any injuries. Um, I don't fatigue. Um, depending on the set, like definitely like if you got like three or four songs that are just 100% all the time, like you definitely feel that, but I don't, I don't get leg cramps or I don't, um, yeah, it's kind of at that point, it's a stamina endurance cardio thing, you know? So that's, that's what I do. And I, I've had to be strict about it if I'm going to try and be, um, you know, effective. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, we have a few questions that came in about drum writing parts. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to uh, condense two or three questions into one. So um, basically, what is the process part or your, the rhythms? And then secondly, um, like do the writers have these ideas already and then you build upon them or drums that, you know, whatever you're hearing in your head. Um, I mean, we could do a masterclass on these questions, but um, some, some songwriters have a rhythm idea, some don't. Um, so that, that's depending on the writer. Um, Joel, Joel, Joel is a huge rhythm dude. He'll always, hear beats and hear ideas and a lot of the times the writers that do hear these things they write the song to the fit that that beat or that rhythm or yeah. that feeling so the first thing i do is i'm 100 percent respectful of it even if i don't like it and if i think that there's better parts like i'll the first thing i'll do is do whatever i can do to incorporate whatever that rhythm is into the beats mm -hmm. i write because if a song was written towards a a feeling or a rhythm like and I change that then the song is not going to feel like how the songwriter intended the song to feel so um it depends on the writer so that's the answer to that question but um if if they come to me and they've got a, a beat in their demo the first thing I ask is like do you want this or not and if they say no that's just a placeholder do whatever you want great and then I'll listen to the song without any rhythms because I, I have an ear like I that's how I learn music yeah. is through ear like so if i hear it too many times i can't get it out of my head so i'd always rather hear a song without a beat unless they want that rhythm and if they want that rhythm i'll, I'll find the most creative way to play it or the coolest way um or just something that like i can take a little bit of pride in that i you know myself and play but also like if it's a simple floor tom beat and it's perfect for the song, I'm going to play that, you know? So um, my goal is never to just write um, something bizarre or creative. That's never my goal. It's my goal is to write parts that um, make the song, bring the song to life. And if that's something really simple, great. If that's something a little bit complicated, cool. Um, but to answer the main question, I guess, as quickly as, as easily as I can, um, the biggest thing I listen to when writing drum parts is the melodic rhythm. Um, so like, obviously that what the lyric is saying is important. If, if this, if the song is about something like delicate, I'm not going to bring out my double kick drums and start, you know, 
Um, but if the song is about something powerful or, or victorious, like that's going to change the parts that I write. But the melodic rhythm is, is huge because if we want people to sing these songs, then it needs to feel like you, we've created a foundation that's comfortable for them to sing these songs on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you listen to most, most songs on, that I've drummed on, um, and you listen to where I place the kicks and the snares and the toms, it's always going to complement the melodic rhythm, whether that is on the same beat as the melodic rhythm, um, so what the person sings, or whether it is in between and like adds weight to what they're about to sing, if that makes mm. sense. Do you have an example? So, um, yeah, um, what a beautiful name. Um, that what a beautiful name it is. Da -na -da -na 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 -da -na. That's a melodic rhythm. The drum pit part is like it's this, it's exactly what the people are singing. Yeah. It's just that I moved it between the tom and some rims and, and open, open snares off snare. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think, did you ever uh, record a video of that, like a tutorial? Yeah, I think we, because we always try and do instrument part videos for our albums, the Hillsong Worship album. Yeah. So I think I think I did one at the end of a tour in 2016. Like, I don't. Yeah. I think that I think there's one. I think there's one we released. But I don't yeah, know how accurate so. it is because I remember recording it before the album was out. And I remember not being 100% sure what I actually played uh, on the night, but it, I'm, I'm sure it's like 99% there. It just might not be perfect. Yeah. Um, nice. But yeah, no, I think there's a cheat. I think we have like a Hillsong instrument parts YouTube somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're good for like one or two more questions? Yeah, I'm down. All right, let's go. Okay, so Victor Lado is saying, like, uh, he feels, let me just read it. Sometimes I see myself doing the same thing over and over again. Part stuck in drumming. So I guess like increasing your vocabulary on the kit. Yep. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'm trying to piece that together, but increasing your vocabulary i mean i like to listen to all kinds of music and just keep my i like to listen to new music i like to listen to diverse range of music but i also like i think of drums very mathematically um like as in it's almost like a skyline like a city skyline like and there's different things in different parts like um so i think that like if you you can start with basic stuff and I hope I'm answering this right because I didn't hear everything super correct. But if you're talking like in a church context or a writing context and you want to kind of not play the same thing every time, then listen to music that does something that inspires you that is not something you can currently play or currently have in your vocabulary. And then also... Um, Think of things in a really simple sense, like, okay, I always put, I always play this kick and snare pattern. Well, what if I replaced one of those kicks with a floor tom, you know? Um, like if it was do 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 ga, what if I did do do boom ga? Like, start yeah. thinking about what are the beats I do play? What What's my go-to? What am I comfortable with? And then what happens if I add a snare somewhere or change a snare here or there or change move the snare to you know an, an eighth across and then add a kick where the snare would have been like i don't know if that answers the question because i didn't fully hear it does that answer it yeah 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 it, it was uh basically a drummer who feels like they're stuck playing you know the same parts or they're, they're listed in their vocabularies yeah right yeah cool no there's a, there's a lot of ways to do it and ultimately like i think that just um if you hear if you hear something that you think would be really cool to play 
um, and you're not, your skill level isn't there, then like figure out how to get your skill level there. Cause that's often the thing I find for me is like, I hear things that I can't play. I'm not good enough to play. So I'm like, well, I've got to get better. So pay attention to what you're hearing and what, what you, you kind of feel as well. Anyway. Yeah, that's really good. Um, another question from Kurt Herman and Dom Gerald's, by the way. Oh my God. Bus for life, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I love Dom. Dom is, Dom is the, the man. Good. Um, okay. Where did the idea of the drum part played in the build section into the end of Hillsong Worship's version of So Will I come from? The alternating ride and floor tom thing. Very specific. <laughs> um it's actually a really funny question because i had one chance to play that and and so i don't know i actually don't know i just kind of what happened was we decided because it was an album of new songs but so well i was already a song that we sang in church it was already released so uh we were we were essentially just doing the song like normal like we normally would in church but our producer said hey feel free to write new parts for it to make it fit this context. So I was like, okay. So about half an hour before we sound checked it, I just thought of it. I just kind of thought of parts. I was like, okay, what are the key rhythms that Simon wrote that are important to the song? And then similar to what I said earlier, it's like, um, how can you take the rhythms you've already done and then just put them somewhere else on the kit? So I tried to keep the essence of the song the same. And then um yeah yeah so i i i just thought through what i'll play and i thought i was going to have a million run-throughs to get it d dialed but essentially the second time i played it ever was this what, what we released so it's a good thing wow. to have the ability to mentalize stuff but essentially like if, if i'm thinking of the right section it's you know it builds on the snare um i just kind of thought that was cool like i love i love long snare builds that create a lot of tension and then obviously wanting to release that into something that paid off that huge snare build. Um, I wanted to keep the do 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 go, you know, the do 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 go, do 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 go. But I was like, how can I play that open? Um, I just just played it open, you know, it, it was pretty simple. Like it just kind of made sense. I did change the kick pattern to be straighter. I think that might have been a comfort thing at the time, like kind of feeling like I don't want to come out of this straight build and then jar people a little bit with a really awesome kick pattern that I probably w was going to mess up. So I just played it straight. And then, <laughs> and now we do it on tour and I do like, I do a little bit of a, my own kind of version of that. So That's so cool. Very Is that, cool. Did I answer, uh, answer that right? Yeah, you did. You did. Okay. Um, so, Oh, okay. One last question, and then I'll I'll close with a question of my own. Uh, do you have a drum tech? If not, are you accepting applications? <laughs> well, you know what? I actually don't have like one specific drum tech. Like we kind of every tour is sometimes different. So, I mean, yeah, I don't I don't have a personal one. We often have like a few techs that cover everything and then one of them will set up drum but the last two tours we did it was different each tour but still guys in our world so yeah. um yeah i think <laughs> uh, first, so i use for it in you know <laughs> yeah yeah oh, i get it totally it's all good um okay so um man these questions keep coming in and they're pretty good listening right now Sorry. What are you listening to right now? Oh, lately. Okay. Lately. Okay. Let me let me pull up my let me pull up my phone. Spotify playlist for the win. No, I'm I have I have Spotify, but I use Apple Music. Ah, um. Nice. Okay. One album that I've been loving is. Um, I'm trying to think some albums I might not share just because That's I don't fine. know the audience. 
Um, okay, well, let me think. Okay, there's a, a band called Night Traveler from Austin, and I had been listening to that album. Actually, you know what? This is a good one. This is a good one. So um, they're called Night Traveler. The album is called Dreams You Don't Forget. And the thing that blows my mind about this album is A, how good the songs feel. And most of the songs are exactly the same drum beat. And it's straight, it's simple. But the drum tones on it are good. It's just like, it's just, I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's it's like inspiring to um, hear how the drums actually might not need to change at all for the song. And then like maybe in the chorus, there's a little tom or something that changes it a little bit or the kick pattern changes. But the 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 it's pretty linear, you know? Yeah, but, yeah. So that's an album that has kind of influenced me a little bit lately. Nice. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff I'm listening to. <laughs> Inspiration. No, it's good. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's wrap this up. We're almost at an hour. So thanks for all the awesome questions, fam. Um, but if there is one word of advice or a word of encouragement, you want to leave with us some parting words of wisdom from Dan. Um, what, what, what would you want to say to the worship drummer fam? as we end this tonight? Oh man, there's a lot of things. There's a lot, there honestly is, because one thing I, I, I get really bothered by is when people beat themselves up because they're comparing themselves to too many other people. And it's like, don't underestimate the power of like simplicity and don't, don't underestimate the power of, I would, I, would always rather be a simple but solid drummer than a messy chops drummer. So I will always encourage you to get better and practice your chops 100%. But don't underestimate the power of what you do to a stage of people if you create the most solid thing for them to stand on. And if, if, if you don't have time to practice, like, I mean, I haven't had a drum kit in my house since I left home at 18. So like, I understand the struggle of not being able to practice, you know, I still like up until three years ago, practiced on pillows. So, um, and yeah, don't, don't like, I'll always encourage you people to get better, but don't discount yourself or let yourself be discouraged if you feel like you might be hitting a wall or if you feel as though um, what you bring isn't necessarily like the coolest or the most interesting thing. Um, I think that when I hear a drummer whose pocket is just consistent, I'm like, that's my guy. Like, you know, like if, if, if I, if I hear a drummer that's trying to do something that's a little bit outside of their comfort level, then I'm, I'm like, well, that's awesome. Keep practicing that thing. But, right. you know, I'll, it's like, don't underestimate um, the power of like just being solid and simple. So I don't know if that's actually good, but there's a lot of things. But like, I just don't like when guys kind of think they've got to be the best there is to, to be good enough for church, like, and be good yeah. enough to have a career in it, you know? And so good, man. I hope that's good. I don't know. There's a lot of things to encourage people. Someone just said you need to open a YouTube account, to share all your knowledge. <laughs> yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> or or we'll do this at some point. Yeah. Uh, Masterclass with Dan McMurray. I'm down. Um, yeah. Man. Um, that's really cool. Normally, I would end and say like, where can people? follow you and keep up to date but um if you um and hey if you ever behalf so cool and if you ever if you ever need some content while i'm out on the road you, you always you got my number so let's go man <laughs> Yeah, no, I, lo I love it, man. You've been such a good friend and uh, 
I really appreciate tonight and the time that you've given us just to hang out on the Worship Drummer Hangout. So um, for those of you, just as we sign off, um, this is something we're going to do once a month. And so, you know, if there's a guest, a next guest that you want us to, to have on, just let me know, shoot me a DM on Instagram, uh, or if you want to throw it in the comments of this video, if you've watched to the end, uh, then that'll be great. As well, uh, these Worship Drummer Hangouts will turn into podcast episodes for the Worship Drummer podcast. So for those of you like just listen to this, uh, by next week it should be live. So that's it for this Worship Drummer Hangout. And Dan, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I miss you guys. And yeah, I'll see you guys at some point soon. All right.